then I'll ask um, Leonie to start the presentation. Leonie. Yeah. yeah, so I have my mic on and of course, Ivo, uh, and whoever's going to be a speaker this afternoon, please put on your camera when you are a speaker so we can see you. And if you have some slides, you can use uh, uh, the share screen uh, option, of course. Uh, and later on, when we have this discussion with everyone present, whoever wants to speak up uh, and is feels uh, and wants to feel free to to um, uh, to share your face, uh, please feel free. But when you don't want to, it's okay even. So welcome to this uh, data lab. I, I, I've lost track how we uh, how many times we did this before, uh, but it's always a pleasure to be here uh, on these first days. And at least this is the second time uh being here uh in this international setting and uh last time was in april when we were in the midst of a COVID crisis i can say uh and i think we have moved on now to a COVID situation at least we were not that afraid of each other anymore like we were last time in april and the streets i don't know how it is everywhere in the, all over the world but last time in april when we met Everyone uh, was uh, confronted by these very empty streets. We did not look like cities uh, at all. Uh, at least in Amsterdam, uh, people are around again, still not as busy as we used to. Uh, but it's a different situation now. But still, uh, which is still the same, is that all over the world we are facing the same situation, which is uh, this pandemic we're in. Uh, where we need to take care of ourselves and our loved ones and even the people we don't love, but the people close to us. And everywhere all over the world, we are trying to figure out how to keep a, a trace of the people who have COVID and, and how to make sure we have less people uh, getting COVID. So today we're uh, joining in again and tuning in again on this tracing apps, because how can technology be of help uh, for us human beings to, to, to stay human, that help, a little bit of help of technology. We asked you, everyone came, coming in, uh, would you uh, use a tracing app? We got some results of that. Manushka, is it possible to pull up the slide again? There it is again. And we asked you this same question uh, in, in April. And again, I can see that we we're surrounded with uh, over 50 people, mostly very social people, because uh, they say, well, I would, uh, if there is a COVID app, a, a tracing app, I would use it because uh, it helps to find and reduce outbreaks. So uh, this is the technology that can ensure a safer society. Uh, and even people who said, I, I would like to use it uh, because it helps to protect vulnerable people. There are some people who say, well, I won't use it at all. Uh, and it would be interesting to get to know why uh, you don't want to. Uh, and please share this in the, in the chat, for example. Uh, so the people who are developing these COVID tracing apps, it's important to learn why people won't, don't want to use it so we can see whether we can address this. What we learned last uh, time in April, is that uh, although we are in the same situation, we have different approaches, mostly because we have different cultures, different finance, different ways of acting. So again, today it's about having this interaction of these differences and learn from each other and see what can be copied and what can be shared uh, and how we can make sure uh, that we have this interaction of digital tools with the analog tools. Uh, and of course, how can we make sure that people are going to adopt and embrace these corona tracing apps because if we don't use them, uh, we will not be able to have a, a good use of them. So we have a great lineup today. Uh, so I'm very proud of that, of my team uh, who had come up with this uh, lineup. And it's Ivo Jans uh, from the Dutch Ministry of uh, Health. He's the co-developer of uh, uh, the Dutch Corona Tracing app. We have Helene Smeets uh, joining us from the Amsterdam KKD Health Security Services, and she is uh, giving some info what they need of an app and how it could help their work and where it doesn't. Gare Macriosca from Ireland is joining, able to talk about uh, the successes they have. 
Then we go over to Norway, where they very early on adopt, uh, 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 developed a corona app, but had to stop because of privacy issues. So what happened there? Why did it happen? And what can we learn from that? And what did they do uh, till then? And at the end, we have Hanny uh, Grasegger from Norway, uh, from Switzerland, I'm sorry. He's a journalist uh, and can have some reflections and learnings from different countries to share with us. And at the end, we have our own Cornelia and you guys uh, uh, all along uh, on this interactive chat. Uh, so you can have everything you put in the chat on questions for our panel, and she will be the moderator of this discussion at the end. Uh, so welcome to all who's just joined us. Uh, please to get a bit of a feeling who's in there. Uh, Minushka, could you please go to the next slide uh, and, and share with us and share amongst each other um, where, which country are you from? So we have a bit of a feeling where we, with whom we are in the room now. You have the code upstairs. So we have some people from Netherlands, from Denmark. And in the meantime, Ivo, uh, if you don't, do want to share a screen, uh, you can put up everything ready. Because um, in a minute, I'm going to give the floor to you. Yep, got everything ready here. So we have an international uh, group again, mostly from um, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, Ireland aside, and I see already uh, the screen from uh, Ivo, uh, which is great. Uh, people from Germany, I saw Suriname as well. Um, so thank you all. So we have a bit of a feeling with whom we're in the room right now. I wish you all a, a pleasant uh, hour and a half, a bit less. And let's go to Ivo. Ivo, you are one of the co-developers of this uh, Dutch Corona app. Very um, uh, uh, unusual way of having uh, developed uh, apps in the Netherlands and having this this, this process. It was a very open process. Uh, people joining in with this hackathon. And in the end, it has resulted in, in what we have now. I have it on my phone. I cannot use it yet, but I still did try. So could you please take us along with you? How does the app work? So not how did the process go, but where are we now? So how does the app work? Which features have you put in? And what did you do uh, to make it an appealing and understandable app for people so they would like to use it? Uh, and have it uh, as a means of, uh, of, of helping us to get to a safer society. Ivo, for a minute or ten, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome, I thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, as soon as I switch to my slides, I can no longer see the Teams environment. So if somebody can just confirm that you can see my slides, then... Uh... Ivo, we cannot please. see you and we cannot hear you. So please put on your camera and your mic. I have both on. Hello, hello. Uh, are hello, people hello. doing you in? Hello, hello. Here we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay, cool. Um, so wait. Can Eva, you, please. You can also see my screen with the slides. No, I see Harry. Oh, crazy. <laughs> oh, wait, I have to, of course, click the share button then. Uh, yes, this is better. Can you see my slides now? Yep. All right. Um, I'll take you through um, um, yes, some of the history of the Corona Melder. And like you mentioned, it was indeed a very unusual process. Um, First, who am I? I'm, I'm one of the architects of the Corona Melder app. So I'm not a developer, I'm an architect. So that means that I uh, kind of like made the blueprint for the app and uh, designed how the app interacts with the backend systems and how it technically works. Uh, my day-to-day -day job is at an uh, app agency called Egenic. Um, let's look at the uh, Corona Melder. 
uh, at around April 6, uh, we got the advice uh, that uh, we should research these digital solutions to aid contract tracing efforts. And initially there was like a market consultation and the government checked if there were any solutions in the market uh, that were ready to be rolled out. Uh, and there were about seven solutions that, that seemed ready. Uh, so uh, the government organized an epathon and the epathon uh, was publicly broadcasted and everybody could look at these seven solutions and could uh, uh, analyze them. And um, the result was basically that none of these uh, seven solutions uh, met our privacy requirements or the technical requirements or, or wasn't ready. And so um, on April 22nd, the government basically decided to create their own open source solution. Uh, so in May, uh, uh, I joined uh, along with a number of other people. We had a team mixed of government and external people, which already makes it quite unique. And we formed an open source community. So where are we now? Like in June, we did the first field test with help of the military. Um, so that was to, to basically test the Google Apple uh, technology and the Bluetooth uh, uh, stack. Um, and in July, we had the first lab test and the first field test in Twente. And that was mostly to, to, to basically research the UI and the UX of the applications to see if it would work and if it would fit the public. And on uh, uh, July 16, we had the public launch of our website. And August 17, we started the current beta test. We're currently in a beta test with five GGD regions. So in five regions, the, the app is actually operational and people can uh, mark themselves as infected. And hopefully soon we can move that to a public launch. So uh, we're currently waiting, for, of course, for the for the government to decide when we can launch. There's some uh, legislation that still needs to be sorted out. So we hope that uh, that soon we can go live in the rest of the country. So what made us our, our process so unique is that uh, from the beginning we sought to do it very transparently. So that made means that the designs, the graphical designs, were available on GitHub. The code was available. All of the documentation, everything was available on, on GitHub. So everybody could really look into how we were building this application. And um, uh, we, we've noticed that some countries have chosen to open their source like after the project was completed, but we wanted to do it right from the start so that everybody could chip in and everybody could contribute to this. And uh, yeah, that, that, that kind of worked because we had lots of contributions from the community. But of course, that also means some challenges. Um, if you have an open process and everything happens in the open, it's really hard to keep a secret. And of course, we don't want to have a secret, but we had one nice incident where Hugo de Jonge, our minister, wanted to announce the Corona Meld of app on, uh, I think it was a Wednesday. And like two days before, someone in the community uh, just saw in, in, the, in the certificate logs of the, of the sites that we were registering, what the name would be. So, so two days, days in advance, we already leaked the, 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 the name of the app. So that was kind of a funny incident, but it was also an illustration that if you do everything out in the open, then it's really hard to, to, to keep secrets like this. Also, that means that the press sees a lot. Um, the press basically also is part of our Slack channel. They communicate with developers, but they also look at our GitHub. And that means that uh, they're really on front of everything that happens. So as soon as we announce that the application is available on 94% of the devices, the press might say, hey, that means that a million devices cannot run it. So we really have to, to find a way to, 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 to cope with that, that to, to make sure that everything we do uh, is seen in the, in the right way. And we sometimes have to yeah, make corrections to what, uh, what the press is, uh, is, is saying. Um, but also what we notice is that the transparency really pays off. And one of the things that was testament to that is that on the, uh, in the very first week, we were already hit a million downloads. And that was, was without any campaign. That was just from press attention, et cetera, and just, just from people following the process and uh, noticing that the app was in the store. So that was really hopeful. Also in the test, we also saw that this transparency really helps people to understand the app because a lot of resistance to the app, uh, people, people are really afraid of their privacy and they want to, don't want the government to track them. But because we're so transparent and because we actually opened up the, 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 the code and we can let's show everybody how it works and, and how it doesn't work, like, like for example, that we don't track any locations and that we don't violate your privacy, that really helped convince people. And, and the, on the right, you see an example of a, of a, of a press, uh, uh, something that was in the press that where, where people really tested the app and really noticed that it, it really works uh, well and, and protects the privacy very, very well. So they were all very happy to, to actually use it. 
of course, one of the challenges uh, is that uh, because uh, we have so much privacy in the in the application, uh, it also means we're kind of blind we, because we don't measure anything in the app because we don't want to to violate anyone's privacy by measuring things. Uh, but that also means that we were kind of blind to to what the app is actually doing, uh, and but we still want to measure this effectiveness. So how do we do that? We track the number of app store downloads. We look at secondary statistics like how many tests get requested, mentioning the app as a source. And we conduct service and polls. Now, this is, of course, something that we'll have to that we'll have to see in practice because since we're not live in the entire country yet, we're really going to have to tune and see how well these statistics work for us. So I'm also happy to learn from the other speakers how that went in their country and, and what they're seeing in their numbers. Another challenge is that the app is only because everybody talks about the app, right? But the app is only a part of a really large ecosystem, and it's a, it's a a key component that is designed to help the traditional uh, bron and contact onderzoeks, like like the traditional contact tracing. And embedding in that health ecosystem is really vital for the app, um, because the, the the GGD they need to confirm the positive tests. Otherwise, we cannot. Uh, uh, notify any people because we only want the notification to be done when there is an actual positive test. And because we found that important, from the start we researched various alternatives how to embed the app in the contact tracing process. We looked at how the other countries were doing it. We looked at how the traditional contact tracing process works. So we really did tests early on with staff and now we're doing the field test with these five regions. Uh, because we find it really important to minimize the amount of steps it takes the health staff to actually um, confirm something in the app. And on the right, you see a little screenshot of the portal that the GDD uses to actually uh, do a confirmation in the app when they do a phone call with uh, with the patient. And we really try to help them through that process and say, okay, and show, okay, how can we help the person uh, get the code into the app and uh, notify people. So what's next for us? Um, basically, once we go live, of course, we need to do a public campaign. And even in the public campaign, um, the uh, the whole transparency is kind of like the most important thing. We really want to show what the app can do, uh, how the app works, why it's safe to use, uh, why the privacy is, is very well protected. So the transparency is not only during the construction of the app, but also in our communication. And that's a really important uh, important factor. Because we've noticed that yeah, most of the resistance comes from unfamiliarity and false assumptions about the app. Many people still think that the government will track you if you use the app. And just by showing that we don't and by actually proving that we don't by showing the source code, that's uh, that's one of the, the main things to help people adopt the app. And I hope to, that that fit well within my uh, 10 minutes. So if there are any questions? Oh. Yeah. Uh, you did, Ivo. Uh, that was great. Uh, we have the, some, some questions at the end. Could you please stop sharing and put on your camera so we can see you? Yeah, let me just find the stop sharing button. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there you are. Thank you so much. Um, what I did not say at the introduction uh, of this afternoon, but we have Amsterdam Smart City, uh, we have this innovation platform existing for already 11 years. And we are driven to create better streets uh, cities uh, uh, by the use of technology, but not as such. We want to have uh, wise cities, wise regions, and we think that technology can be of help if it is having this cooperation with uh, analog systems like you told us. And we believe that if we put some values at place, uh, we have better technology. And our core values are uh, to create public value, to have it human central, to so think of citizens first and people first, to be transparent and have a learning by doing approach. And when I listen to you, uh, Evo, you take away really all our boxes. So. Um, uh, I was impressed by that and, and, and very proud of this, this Dutch approach. Uh, and, and of course, the app is not live in, in the Netherlands yet everywhere, but you, you said it, it's paying off. This, this transparency, I think, has some downsides because whenever you are learning, uh, the failures are transparent as well. And the press loves to uh, address failures. Um, so you need to keep up with that and, and show it's a learning process and not a failure process. But what you said it paid off. But 
what did the most you think was the most important ingredient uh, of, of, of where you are today? What would be the key success? Yeah, I, I think that that open process, so like, like not just doing this as a government project somewhere in a, in a room, uh, but but doing it out in the open, uh, attracting people from outside the government to do it, like there, there's there's a mix of government and external people, and mm -hmm. having the community, because the community has, has uh, all through the, the development has been proven very valuable, because they give us feedback, they give us input, they give us ideas, so yeah, that, I think that, that has really helped. Uh, and of, of course, the, the success, uh, we will only be able to look at that once we are live. But from a technical perspective, like like the, where the app is today in, uh, in in terms of what it can do, yeah, we really have the uh, the community to thank for that. Yeah, great. Thank you. And before we go to our next speaker, what would be your question for the speakers to come or even the audience? What would you yeah. like to learn? Yeah, like I mentioned, like like we're not live yet, so we we don't have like the the, the visibility yet of, of of how the app will work in practice. But what I'm really uh, keen to hear, to learn from the other speakers is how that has uh, has been done in their countries. Uh, like what are they seeing in in terms of uh, uh, a success effect? How do they measure these things uh, while still preserving the privacy? Okay, great. I guess, and I'm now only for sure, uh, they will address these questions as well. So thank you a lot. Stay uh, with us because at the end, uh, other people will have some questions for you as well, I'm sure. Thank you. And we move on to Elaine. Elaine, could you please put on your camera? Yeah, there you are. And great to have you here from the health service uh, of the city of Amsterdam, the GGD, joining us. And like Ivo already mentioned, um, uh, the success of the app is highly dependent on the co-working, not only of, of us citizens using it, uh, also of the healthcare professionals uh, being able to work with it. So uh, you have some 10 minutes as well. And could you please take us with you? How can this app make your work easier? Because you were one of the first KGDs in, in the Netherlands who needed to, uh, well, who couldn't keep up with the, with the testing uh, by the tracing, uh, uh, contact tracing uh, work you did. So how can this app be of, of a help for you? Yes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you uh, for, for inviting me for this interesting uh, event. Um, I will first introduce myself as well. Can everybody see the, the slides? Yeah, you're visible. Perfect. Um, so my name is Helene Smeets. I am part of the Corona Prevention Team at the GGD Amsterdam. And um, my task is to, uh, with my team, set up interventions to reach specific populations and to collaborate with them, with those populations, to develop and implement different kind of interventions. And um, the, the goal is then to, to stop the spreading of the virus. And the, the app is one of the, uh, the tools that, that could help us. Um, so what I would like to start with, and I hope you can see the numbers a little bit, um, but I would like to show that the, within Amsterdam, there's a lot of differences between the different neighborhoods uh, and the different um, uh, other municipalities in the region. So here we see in week 35 and week 34, uh, the absolute number of uh, people who got a positive test back uh, per region and per, and per neighborhood actually. Uh, and the same per 10,000 uh, uh, inhabitants. And uh, what we can see, for example, in the center, uh, there, there was uh, an absolute number in week 35 of 43 people, and it was 4.9 per 10,000 inwoners, per 10,000 inhabitants. And in New West, another neighborhood, there was an absolute number of 109, and uh, per 10,000 in, uh, inhabitants, this was six. Point eight. So that's already quite a difference. Um, in the next slide, I have the same numbers, but then for the amount of tests done. And there, if you look, for example, uh, at the difference be between the center and uh, New West, which is another neighborhood, you can also see quite a difference in the absolute number, but also in the number per 10,000 uh, inhabitants. Um, and so this is the amount of people who were from this neighborhood who did a test in any test location of the GGD in the Netherlands. Um, so with that, I just wanted to show quickly uh, that there are loads 
of differences between the neighborhoods. And this has been known before. These are uh, neighborhoods that uh, show differences in, in other health indicators as well. If we look at uh, um, a high level or at, at overweight, um, we can we can see those differences. And um, also, for example, there are a lot of uh, people with a migrant background living in those neighborhoods. So we, we sort of know that there's uh, more than only health issues going on in those neighborhoods. And it would be for us uh, wonderful if the app could support these neighborhoods that are lacking behind a little bit in their numbers of getting tested and that are that, that show a, a high rate of uh, positive tests in their neighborhood. If we can help uh, use the app to help them and support them to get tested whenever they have symptoms. And a small uh, insight in how we approach this at the moment, we are using, and maybe some of you know this, um, the behavioral change wheel, uh, which is a method that is um, made to change behavior. Um, and um, we work with all the neighborhoods together. They, they all, Amsterdam is that big and the, the other regions as well, that they all have a small sort of municipality and we ask them to set up their own prevention team for each region. And we are working with them and with this model to research uh, what is going on in their region. Um, and what we try to figure out is what their motivators and barriers are in order to influence the capability and the opportunities that they have to to get tested. For example, when we look at the capability, uh, they have a physical capability, which is, for example, the ability to get to the test location um, and then psychological, the motivation to get there. And that is, for example, uh, an aspect where the, the, the app could, could have an influence. And for the opportunity, um, uh, we see that there are social experiences um, but there is also a place where uh, if the, the app would tell them to get tested, that this might give them an extra support or an extra uh, um, motivation to, to get tested. Um, so we um, also looked a little bit now at what we know from health apps. The prevention team is part of a bigger program that has done a lot of prevention programs in Amsterdam and in the other uh, municipalities in the region. And um, what we know about health apps is that they are not used by all populations. Um, if you look at populations that have a lower socioeconomic status, they might not use uh, health apps as much as other uh, populations. And it's mostly used by people uh, who are already interested in their health status, of course. If you look at, for example, uh, Fitbit and those kind of uh, already existing uh, health indicators or health uh, 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 things that can help you, um, then they are mostly used by people who are already watching their, uh, uh, their health status. And um, it is also used by people who would like to improve their, their health status. So they, they have some knowledge about health. And if we look at the neighborhoods uh, which are lacking behind in their uh, test numbers and which show also the most positive tests, um, then the, the people there are, are already also on other, other health indicators lacking behind. So the big challenge there, and uh, it's a little bit, uh, or it's con quite connected to the challenge that Ivo already mentioned as well, is how can we get the app uh, applicable for those who are not already going uh, for tests when they have symptoms? How can we uh, use the app to motivate the people who are lacking behind? Um, and how can the app influ influence the motivators and the barriers. So we are working with the parts, with the neighborhoods to see specifically there what are the motivators. And um, we would like to uh, to see how the app can, can help them um, uh, to get tested when they, uh, when they have symptoms. Um, then I also wanted to connect it to the contact tracing that, that we do as the GGD. Um, of course, when, when someone gets uh, infected, we uh, give them a call and we explain that they need to stay at home and we explain all the rules. And um, the app, uh, what we have seen in, in the past few weeks, actually, 
uh, is that people have been getting uh, a bit less trust in, in our research. So they're not always uh, collaborating with us. They're not always giving us the details on where they have been and who they've seen. Um, and we hope that this app will help uh, with gaining the trust. Um, but we also see that there are some risks here uh, and which was also what Eva was stating is that they might fear um, uh, the app because they think that we can track them uh, and they think that uh, um, that we can see wherever they are going. Um, and of course, it has been transparent, but the the people who are uh, who have the most fear, I think they they are also unfamiliar with looking up a code and seeing if it actually is tracking uh, them. So I think the media has a big role here as well to explain uh, well, and also the campaign, the 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 Dutch camp campaign that will be set up uh, when the when the app gets live. Um, it has to explain very well what it is actually doing. Otherwise, it will create fear, and it will create fear, especially in those group who who are already afraid. Um, but on the other hand, I think it, uh, if it's well explained, it will uh, uh, hopefully also gain some honest, gain some trust, which will make uh, the people more honest when they are um, uh, infected, that they know that the GGD has everything under control and that the app is only going to help us with that. Um, so in conclusion, and also to put up some questions already for uh, for everyone who's attending, um, I think it will uh, only be applicable for a certain part of the community uh, and the, the challenges to, uh, to see how it can influence the motivators and the barriers of the group that is in the gray area, let's say and insight is needed in the different types and barriers of motivators to use the app. And um, then the questions are how to promote the app for uh, the communities with who are underprivileged or who have a low socioeconomic status. And um, also a question to everyone, I guess, is, is what is the best method to research the, the on how to improve the app? Um, uh, we are here working together with the communities itself. Uh, which we think is a is a very good way to to research the motivators and the barriers, but maybe there are other experiences here in the group as well. So uh, that was my story. I hope I stayed within the ten minutes. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, but it was a great story. So uh, thank you for it. So I didn't even keep track of time. I'm so intentionally listening. So I will be brief. Uh, if you stop uh, uh, screening, uh, sharing your screen, we might pull up your face. Yeah, there, there you are. Go. Thank you so much, Helene. Uh, what was really impressive is um, you said we have to, to need uh, the need to connect to people to, to get them to test. Uh, some of them are even afraid of not knowing well uh, to get tested, and we hope this technology, these tracing apps, will help them to come over to the GGD even to, to get tested. And what for me was uh, impressive is the, the way, in a detailed way, uh, you have this motivation uh, research going on so you can really address the specific needs of specific groups, yeah. uh, how to reach them. So. Um, like we said before, if, if you want people to use stuff and if you want pe to, to, people to put uh, them central, you need to take the time to really de to get to understand them. And so that's nice of your last question to the audience even, how can I make a better connection to these people to get them to understand, to use the app, to trust it? Ivo said, uh, transparency is key. If I be, I, I'm, I, I'm being very transparent, I'll gain more trust and if people trust it, um, they might be able to use it. Would it be, be, be the case, do you think as well, or would it be the anonym, uh, to be anonymous? Uh, could that be a driver for people? But with the app, I can share with everyone I have COVID without telling I am the one uh, who, who got it. Yes, yes. I think the transparency as far uh, as it has been uh, now has been very good. Um, but I also do think that there is a part of the community uh, who doesn't know platforms like GitHub and who doesn't know um, how to uh, to look at those codes and to research what those codes are actually doing. 
Uh, I think in the in the beginning of Corona, um, we have also seen that in the Netherlands it was connected to uh, to 5G, which was installed at that point, and there were a lot of theories uh, on um, uh, how how it came here and how what was the source and everything. Um, so I think people will come up with their own rumors uh, also if we are transparent. Okay. Um, so I think that is important to learn from the beginning of, uh, of this epidemic and also from other epidemics um, that, that people will come up with rumors and that you have to try to make sure that your information will get to the, to the same people as who are believing in those rumors so that you can, uh, can change them around and can change your thoughts about it. Okay, great. Thank you. And maybe uh, later on the community can help you uh, with your questions. Let's move on. Thank you so much, Helene. Let's move on. And Gary um, is already present. Gary. Uh, I read um, Ireland, and which is great, has some really wonderful features in your COVID uh, tracking. Uh, so much that other countries are looking to you and see what can we learn and could we adapt. So could you please share us with us uh, uh, how is your uh, tracing app work? Uh, how did you come to this? And, uh, and, and, and what's the situation in Ireland right now? Uh, sure. Of yours and thank you so much. Good. Thanks, Leonie. Um, I was laughing while I was listening to Evo because it's uh, so I think anybody who's been involved in that and Helene, like the, our stories are so very similar. It doesn't matter which country it's we all went through the same journey. We all had a lot of the same obstacles and a lot of the same challenges. And we're now facing the next piece. And I think one of the, the really interesting pieces is because we're all trying to solve the same problem and it's all happening in parallel. The collaboration between internationally is it's exceptional. So I can pretty much reach out and connect with me. Uh, well, the person who's in my role and other people who are involved in those projects anywhere in the world at the moment. So I know I've definitely been on calls with Evo before. Uh, I haven't come across Celine, but it's a, it's a very small community of people involved with um, digital contact tracing. So uh, my name is Garma Krista and I'm the uh, the product lead for the COVID tracker app in Ireland. And that was a the government response uh, to digital contact tracing. And I guess, the, uh, so I'm going to give you a quick, and I don't want to, um, uh, to kind of, I, I could basically give Evo's presentation and just change uh, the Netherlands to Ireland and it would work. It's the same, a lot of the same things. We went through a lot of the same obstacles. So I'm going to try not to do that. But uh, I guess for me, this started. So this was the graph of COVID from uh, from March until July. And I got involved on the 18th of March. And that's so we were kind of a couple of months ahead. And there were teams who were kind of starting this incrementally. Um, so my colleague, Tim Willoughby, who's the head of innovation in the police force in Ireland in Angarda Siakana, uh, he was involved with it as well. And it was a cross government thing. So it wasn't. Uh, so I work for the health service executive who are responsible for the delivery of health services, the Department of Health, the Department of Public Expenditure, and Garda Siakona, which is the police, defense forces, and a bunch of other uh, government entities were involved in this. So it was very much uh, a cross government initiative. So it wasn't just one group, it was many groups. And I think that gave us, I think there's something interesting to that. And we've talked to other groups who've had varying degrees of success in terms of the uh, the ability to kind of bring a coalition together to do things like this. So again, it, back to the 18th, that's when it all began. And the problem we were tasked with solving was how do we identify people who are too close for too long? So, and where one of them is infected. And that was kind of the general problem. And I think back then, as we look back now, it be, it's all very obvious that we were all going to build an app that was based on the Google Apple API and using Bluetooth for proximity detection. So that's, it all seems obvious, but at the time, it wasn't. So we were talking to uh, telecommunications companies to find out, uh, could we use call data records to find out were people in the same based on triangulation of um, cell tower masts? Uh, could we use GPS on the phones, uh, like the, the GPS um, radio on the phone to figure out and use that as an input? Could we use ad identifiers? Could we use QR codes for check-in? Could we use Bluetooth? So we used, uh, even like there were some projects that were running which were using um, emitting sonic bursts and based on sound, it was saying how far people are away from each other like this. And there's a protocol built on it called Chirp. So there were all of these different solutions that were bubbling up at that time. So we hadn't settled and we weren't building, we, we hadn't even settled on building an app back at the beginning. We were just exploring, trying to understand what the problem was that we were trying to solve and looking at all the options, both data and technology that we could use to try and solve for that problem. So 21st of March was kind of the pivotal day. So um, 
there were a number of teams that had begun to build things at that point. So Jason Bay is the lead for the Trace Together app in Singapore. And they were the first. So they had actually started building the app back in January. So it was way ahead of everybody else. So they had built this app, which was based on Bluetooth. Um, I'll, I'll get to the centralized, decentralized conversation, which kind of dominated uh, news media across Europe for a couple of months to do with digital contact tracing. But they built Trace Together. And we more or less at that point had begun had said what so Bluetooth proximity based Bluetooth was a way of going and we began this conversation now poor Jason ended up with 40 countries landing in his inbox on the Saturday morning on Saturday the 22nd of March saying uh, can we have your code can we have your app can you tell us how you did this and so I, I think just from Ireland alone we had probably 20 contacts to that poor guy who landed so if you times that times 40 he had several hundred from like prime ministerial contacts through to like technical contacts through networks and things like that. So it was an interesting time. So we we had more or less said, this is one strand that we're pursuing. We still kept the other ones open. We were talking to social media companies. We were talking to the ad identifier guys. We were talking, we, we kept a number of different strands open at that point. But I guess to, to cut a long story short, um, starting on the 18th of March, we finished on the 6th of, uh, well, sorry, we published this to the App Store and Play Store on the 6th of July. So it was 110 days from end to end. Um, I'm, I'm curious about that. And it's probably something we can go back on because transparency has come up a, a number of times here. Um, we didn't, we weren't transparent about what we were doing at the start. And it was more because we didn't know we had so many options in that we, if we had been transparent at the very beginning, it would have been like opening the door to chaos to show people what we were doing because we were trying to really figure out what the problem was. Uh, I think as things moved on, it became we we became way more open and way more transparent about what it was that we were doing. But this uh, this app is designed to augment existing contact tracing or contact tracing. So we've got testing and tracing was the first thing that we stood up as a health service, and the app is designed to uh, augment existing contact tracing operations. So it fits seamlessly in there and it integrates completely with it. So there's no difference between manual contact tracing and digital contact tracing. You all end, everything ends up in the same place. You're still talking to the same call agents. It ends up in the same case management system. You, you go through the same testing protocols and we get the results back. And I think that's been a core piece of this in that we weren't trying to do something independently of it. It was fully integrated with that. And I think ourselves and, um, and Denmark were the first countries who really had that kind of end to end integration. And it's interesting <laughs> to see the data coming out. And I'll get back to the question Evo had about metrics. But I, I think if I reflect on some of the things that happened, I think one of the key bits, and it was probably lost in a lot of the conversation in the, in the media, was this notion of centralized and decentralized. So if you talk to a public health professional uh, and you talk about contact tracing, they have the notion of an index patient and an index patient is a known person who's tested positive and then manual contact tracing identifies their social graph, their connections, and they become the close contacts. With the decentralized model, we lose that connection. And But if you went looking for requirements from a public health uh, doctor, they would tell you index patient, I must know the connection. So we had to break that. Uh, and this is at a public health thinking perspective to figure out what value can we get by using this decentralized model. And I think this became this like more or less a privacy football to be kicked around across Europe, that centralized was bad and decentralized was good. And it was one of those memes that just kind of kicked off. And there's nothing right or wrong, but I think at a population scale, when you're trying to do this, if you're trying to be open and you're trying to protect privacy, decentralized is your option. It is the only option because otherwise you're building up contact information and social graph information, which we freely give away to Facebook and, and other social networks, but in the context of what a government responds, it's different. So we launched on July 7th, I guess, to, to summary so far. So we're we're about 1.3. So this slide is a small bit out of date. We had a million people within 48 hours. We've grown a bit. We had a specific event several weeks ago. I'll touch on that where we, we lost users because we had a problem with battery life. And again, this is something that I think how you deal with situations like this is going to be one of the issues that these apps face. Uh, so far, we've had um, over 400 people who've tested positive using the app and uploaded their um, the, the random IDs that they collect on their phone. We've had nearly a thousand close contact events. I'd say by close of business today, we've had an uptick in number of cases in Ireland. So we see, a, a, I guess, a related uptick in the norm, a number of close contact events. So about a thousand close contact events have fired and we gather metrics on some of this with the permission of the users. And one of the things that we did, which is slightly different, um, it, we allowed people to put a phone number into the app that if they received a close contact uh, warning, that that phone number would be sent back to the contact tracing teams so they could be supported. Now, initially, this was for people who were in uh, at risk or 
at-risk uh, uh, categories. So they either got an underlying health condition or they were in an at-risk age category. But about 80% of people have put a phone number into the app, which means they're contactable. I think the, the other thing that we did is the app does more. So it was defined as a pandemic response app as opposed to a contact tracing app, which meant, and we added a symptom tracker. We added um, news and information about COVID. So it was updates. So the statistics that we were all fixated with in Ireland, we were we were providing that information to users. And, and that's been a, an interesting channel as we go through it. I think one of the other things that's, uh, uh, that is now popping up is interoperability. So we switched on interoperability with Northern Ireland back We've got about 30,000 people a day going over and back the border across from Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland. So we turned that on when the North went, uh, Northern Ireland app went live, when the Stop COVID app went live. And then we're working on European interoperability. And I think that's going to be the next stage in terms of opening things up, because I would love to go back and visit Amsterdam again. And I think the other piece is that we're now seeing, so we contributed um, the code base for our app into the Linux Foundation Public Health Project. And that has made that code base available. So there's about seven implementations running at the moment. There's another, we know of another four or five that are kicking off, but we can't say who, but it's everything from Pennsylvania and Delaware in the US to Northern Ireland and Scotland in Europe. So we we uh, we have got, I guess, it's again, this building of community. And I think there's some in, something interesting there because it's a global community now that we're beginning to share and coalesce. And we're getting, uh, we're basically feeding back in from stuff that other people are doing back into what we're doing. I think the other piece is the efficacy of this app. So we have had app contacts test positive. So people who've been identified by the app, we can definitively say that some of those people have tested positive and we will have statistics on that later on in terms of outcomes from it. And we'll be able to fill in more, more information on this. I guess to go back to the, the beginning of it, and I, I think the problem isn't necessarily transparency, but I think it's trust. So I, I think we had our chief medical officer was a guy called Tony Holohan, and this is him and his team uh, under the Irish harp uh, as a national response. And we had built trust in advance, but we understood the pressure that was kind of building at that time. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we've all faced is the the memes that have cropped up so the 5g one I, I like it was it was crazy when that happened it never really hit us too bad but we had um the critics were defining the meme space so they defined the shape of the conversations we were we were having and we were trying to solve the problems we had in front of us and didn't recognize that we were we needed to have other that we needed to more actively engage in controlling that meme space meme, or opening that meme space up into something else because we had the demands for transparency we had were the privacy destroyers, and this was part of a surveillance society ploy that the government was trying to get their hands on all your data. We had the centralized, decentralized, good versus evil debate. And then I think the, the one thing that has come out of that is that it's not about transparency, it's not about privacy. This ends up being an individual set of trade-offs for an individual. So you're trading off privacy and sovereignty versus health and well-being versus society and economy. And if you were to map this out, as, as a fitness landscape to say where do, we have the people who are noisiest about a specific topic will end up grab, grabbing all the attention and they grab all the media attention to that. But if you ask anybody like a, from a public consultation perspective, the conversation is not about privacy and sovereignty on or off. This is about the trade-offs we're prepared to make as a society to try and make some progress in our fight against COVID-19. And so it's, I think it's deeper and richer than just about single issue topics. So uh, I think that the other thing to remember is uh, please, Gar. Yes, sorry, sorry. This is it. I'm done. I'm done. But that's so. Uh, so basically, the I guess I'll leave you with this thought: is that on that on that side of it, all you can expect is just a no score draw. You can't win against those debates. All you can expect is that you kind of hit something around that. So apologies. I think I ran over. Everybody else <laughs> hit the button. Apologies for that. So I'm done. That's me. Thank you. Uh, please stop sharing the screen uh, so we can put up, yeah, pull you up. So this was uh, some visionary then uh, back in January already uh, thinking of the app uh, being able to launch it in July. If I'm correct, you had added uh, lots of extra features by now. So with this uh, COVID uh, information, so you're not only a tracing app, but also an information app. Um, and which I really love is your switch to uh, from transparency to trust. And uh, if we talk about people central, well, the same like uh, what Amsterdam did, uh, one person is not the other, so there are different reasons why to not use it or why to use it. Uh, and you broke down these, these, these barriers in these uh, several means. Uh, I'm going to go quickly um, uh, to the next speaker. Uh, but I thank you so much for this, this, this move from uh, transparency to trust. 
and a need for and, and I hope some people within the chat will have some questions for you too. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled by this 80% of people who wanted to use their uh, telephone number. But we go over to uh, Ivan. Not sure I'm pronouncing your name right. Yeah, that was pretty good actually. Ah, well, great. Thank you. Because Gara had care at the beginning. Ivan, you have a slightly different story. You were very early with uh, a Corona app as well in Norway. But something went wrong with privacy and, and it was a showstopper for you. At least that's what I've heard. Please tell us about what happened uh, in Norway. What did you learn? And, and maybe what did you learn today? Uh, floor is yours. Sure, great. Thanks. Um, so as, as you said, I'm sure this will be a bit of a different uh, perspective. Uh, but, but as as some of the other speakers, I won't be able to see the chat myself. So can you just confirm that you can see my slides now? Yeah, you are. You're visible. If you put on your camera, we can see you talking. That is nice too. Okay. One sec. Oh, it says I can't share my camera at the same time. Ah, okay. So then we'll stick to the slides and see who you are later. Wait. You can still see my slides, right? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay. <clears throat> So as you said, I'm going to be talking about the Norwegian COVID-19 app um, briefly. So uh, this COVID-19 app was called Smitte Stop, which uh, roughly translates to infection stop or something like that in Norwegian. Um, quick introduction first. My name is Ivan Iversen. I work as a consultant contractor for a Norwegian company called uh, Bouvé. I mainly focus on privacy and security uh, stuff and uh, I, I write and speak about this regularly. And I was earlier this year a part of the independent expert group uh, the government appointed to evaluate our contact tracing app. Uh, so I'd also just like to mention that uh, I'm, I'm only speaking on behalf of myself today and that this is my professional opinion, but I can't speak on behalf of the, on the Norwegian uh, government or anything like that. So, Back in March of this year, uh, a source code leak revealed the existence of the Digital Contact Tracing Initiative in Norway. Um, it was made known that a company called Similar Research Laboratory was, uh, on behalf of the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, uh, developing an, an application to, to track COVID-19, basically. But already from the get-go, was very little transparency, as you can tell. Um, and we were soon able to read about some of the more controversial design choices in the app, which I'll get back to in a moment. Um, but it was made clear that the source code would not be made publicly available uh, for, for licensing terms reasons, but also because of potential commercial interests and so on. Um, but as you might imagine, this, this was heavily criticized from tech professionals uh, from the get-go. So all of this criticism and the, the, the negative, uh, negative focus of the media so this is one of the one of Norway's largest media outlets, um, but but all this probably motivated the appointment of this independent expert group of which I'm part. Um, so we were tasked basically producing a public report uh, that were to evaluate if security and privacy were reasonably handled or responsibly handled, I should say. So I'm going to quickly walk you through some of the major features of the app. Um, First off, the, the app was voluntary to use in Norway, though uh, the, the formal basis for processing of data was not consent, but a specialized piece of regulation. Um, but other than, other than this, the GDPR still applied, of course. Um, the Norwegian app was also dual purpose in that uh, it not only did contact tracing, but another goal of it was to um, produce and provide data, for instance, that the government could use to evaluate its interventions, maybe uh, uh, see how public movement patterns uh, would react uh, to, uh, to, uh, to government interventions, and also produce data to be used as input for, for instance, epidemiological models uh, in the long run. So as, as some of you might know, producing this sort of long-term uh, use, anonymized and aggregated data comes with its own sort of risks that uh, I, I don't really have time to get into at the moment, but uh, in addition to this, the, the app was kind of made in an all or nothing fashion in that 
users can choose to either have their data used for all of these, uh, the, these app's purposes or not to use the app at all. Um, additionally, the Norwegian solution also uh, collected location data. Now, some of the previous speakers already mentioned that this has been a big subject in some of the, at least the uh, debate uh, in Europe, uh, but the argument made for using location data in the Norwegian solution was that uh, as this was back in March when the when the work started, the argument was that uh, back in March, uh, the, the platform had certain technical limitations. So for instance, you couldn't really get reliable Bluetooth data from an application that was being run in the background and so on. Uh, so one of the arguments was to try to augment this data set in order to get more data to maybe make better decisions, you'd need location data as well. Um, Additionally, the Norwegian app also used a centralized storage model, meaning that all of the sensor data, meaning GPS and Bluetooth uh, data, was continuously uploaded from all users all the time and stored on a central government-operated uh, uh, server so that they could do analysis centrally on that data. Uh, whereas other alternative uh, implementations uh, which would be decentralized uh, approaches would only upload data specifically when needed for uh, a concrete uh, a, a concrete um, uh, operation on a, on, a, on a concrete person, I should say. So this centralized data store is in principle a defining factor when dealing with this sort of private data because as you might imagine, it's, it's very existent, it makes misuse and function creep and, and theft and so on possible in a way that decentralized solution just doesn't, at least not as easily. Um, additionally, there were a few other more technical security issues. Um, and one of them which had uh, a rather big privacy impact was that the Norwegian app used a, um, a, uh, a static device identifier specific to the device. So that your device when meeting other devices would would identify itself with the same piece of information every time. And this makes it, it makes it possible to trace users or impersonate users and so on. Uh, whereas uh, alternative implementations and specifications have, uh, well, at least everyone I've seen have been using so-called rolling identifiers in one way or another. This is a, a rather big impact on privacy, I'd say. Um, in addition to that, most of this data was at least for a time being stored in an encrypted database on user devices before being uploaded, which made it possible to inject or modify data before it being uploaded. So that basically means that much of the data must be considered compromised, at least for a time. Um, and in order to use the Norwegian application, users would have to register using their phone number and by extension, de facto identifying themselves because it's it's uh, pretty much impossible to get a phone number or a, or a phone, um, yeah, phone number in Norway without identifying yourself. Uh, so functionally, there, there doesn't necessarily need to, to be a need to identify yourselves, but this is the way it was implemented anyways in Norway. Um, also, uh, because of basically going, going our own way and implementing the app in this way, uh, there were no real um, possibility for data interoperability. Uh, because the Norwegian app wasn't in accordance with common European guidelines. Uh, so you wouldn't, at least off the bat, you wouldn't be able to support cross-border functionality. Uh, and when you take all of these qualities of the app and see them in the light of this rough timeline of events, uh, you might understand why the public got such a negative uh, opinion about this app. So. Uh, as I mentioned, the app was heavily criticized from professionals from the get-go, like in public, on social media, in the, in the traditional media, and so on. And it was promptly reversed engineered at launch on April 16th, uh, where, where private re uh, security researchers would unveil um, insecurities and vulnerabilities and so on. Um, and... Uh, and as, as soon as Apple and Google announced their... Uh, collaboration on on their contact tracing API or exposure notification API. They also um, where they also rectify the situation that led Isaac? to yeah. I think you you're almost out of time. I'm gonna give a heads up. Okay. Yeah.
Um, so uh, as, as soon as that was announced, the, the pro 300 professionals launched uh, a petition asking the government to change their approach. Uh, also, there was a huge problem with battery drain on launch, which, which led to much negative user feedback. Uh, and our expert group report concluded that neither security nor privacy was handled responsibly. Uh, and that report was then basically publicly attacked by the supplier in this case, um, after which parliament got involved. The data protection authority concluded that uh, the, the invasiveness was justified. And uh, after that, the, the app was basically shut down and gained uh, notoriety in international media, I guess. So um, if we're going to look at how much this impacted uh, our, our infection rates, the Norwegian population is around five and a half million people. Um, the Institute of Public Health stated it would need 50 to 60% market penetration to get good results from contact tracing. Um, and at the time the app was shut down, about 20% of the population had downloaded it, if you exclude uh, potential double downloads or so on. Uh, and in the last week of the app, there was 10% of the population that had uploaded GPS or Bluetooth data. So as far as I can tell, there was little impact on our outbreak from this. And on the other hand, it might even have subverted some trust in our government, which is pretty bad. So. In summary, I guess a critic might say that people were a central element in this solution, mostly as a source of data, and that it's kind of disappointing that that no opportunity to kind of turn things around and listen to criticism were taken, because uh, it's no doubt that this could have been an important, albeit augmentative uh, tool, as we've heard from Singapore and, and others. But uh, I think we sort of shot ourselves in the foot by being too ambitious in data collections and having multiple purposes and so on. And, and maybe not even really understanding the problem nor privacy as a subject really from the get-go here. Um, so I guess one of the last thing I'd like to say is that- Yeah, because I know Hannes needs to leave uh, and I we want to have him on as well. Sure, I I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll finish off then. Uh, I'd just like to say that a good solution has technical guarantees and is not only dependent upon trust. So it kind of highlights and uh, a need to improve our general understanding of privacy, I guess, in the Norwegian case. And uh, that's basically all I'd have to say. And uh, one question I'd like to pose for yeah. uh, for Harry is I'd like to know what the public debate was like in, in the sense that what was the public okay with? Did you have any debates around what the government had a right to do with regards to personal data and so on? Um, um, we can go to that. If you please stop share screen, sharing your screen and pull up your camera, then we can see uh, who are, and to the audience. It's really difficult, I know. If you have this presentation on Teams and you put up your slides, you lose contact with whoever. Uh, so I'm so very grateful for you to do this. Very shortly in, in, in the Netherlands, a discussion was uh, indeed about privacy, transparency, what has to write. And it was like Gar already said, people are very willing to hand over anything to Facebook. Uh, but much more reluctant when it comes to uh, to, to, to governments. Um, we need to go over from, and, but thank you again for putting not only trust, transparency, but technical uh, feasibility as well on the table. We need to go over to Hannes. Uh, do I pronounce that? And thank you so much, uh, Ivan, and stay with us uh, mm -hmm. for the discussion we, we have left so far. Hannes, I'm told I should pronounce it like this. You're a journalist. Uh, writing about uh, the economic mechanisms behind technological change. And you have seen a lot of technology coming into place during this COVID times. And I'm told you have some great reflection on what's going on in Switzerland, Germany, but maybe even more. So again, for you, maybe you have some slides, or we're just going to look at you. And could you please share us some thoughts and reflections uh, being the last speaker? Thank you. Uh, thanks for bringing me in. I soon have to fetch up my kids. Um, and so um, I'm uh, thankful for all these great presentations before. And Ivan, uh, I really, I, your English is really impressive. <laughs> so let me try. Um, I think we were pretty early in Switzerland in terms of um, the um, app development. And as most of you know, um, the whole project um, uh, the that is known as DP3T started around um, 
mid-March in Germany. And then um, a collaboration of um, uh, Swiss, German, Italian, and I think some uh, Belgium and British um, um, developers, privacy experts, scientists, um, evolved, emerged, and um, then in, I think on March uh, 19, I was made aware of these efforts and I started um, reaching out to people um, and um, being in touch with them constantly because I was really interested in whether the app, you know, you remember these dark days, uh, would it become the big solution um, and would it help us uh, to get out of the lockdown? And so um, between mid-March and uh, I think mid-May, we saw this intense battle over um, what looked like privacy wars, um, you know, on Twitter, in the media, um, should we use a decentralized or a centralized version? And um, was everyone was, um, uh, you know, fighting over certain aspects of of each uh, version's um, thing. Um, actually, Apple and Google really made the decision on what. Um, what uh, standard should be uh, used in the future because uh, as it turned out um, effectively they control um, the distribution mechanisms uh, mainly the app stores um, that we all have to use if we want to um, you know spread an app and so i think this is one of the first uh, major findings i think speaking as an economist i've never seen such an amazing monopoly as the joint um, Google Apple collaboration, which determined um, what um, standard should be used for the app. So apart from whether I prefer a centralized or a decentralized version, I was really astonished how they were actually shaping um, uh, the course of things. Because um, in Switzerland, we had a functioning uh, beta version ready just some days before uh, Apple and Google announced uh, the standard um, decision on, I think that was April 10th. And I think on April 1st, we would have had a Swiss um, contact tracing, Bluetooth based, even decentralized version uh, ready at hand. But then we had to go over it again. And, you know, because of that privacy discussion, something very particular started in Switzerland. Um, Regulators um, and politicians um, became really aware of, of, you know, the dangers. And so um, we started a legal process, uh, which takes time. And uh, we developed a um, Swiss um, law governing um, the app use, which defines some very useful points. So we have a phase out. We have... Um, um, we have to find that it needs to be uh, usage needs to be uh, voluntarily and um, you cannot be discriminated against if you don't use it. For example, there was a big discussion in Switzerland about whether people should be able to uh, again uh, visit restaurants or go to party in nightclubs uh, without using the app because we have this uh, contract tracing um, uh, standard that you know, locations should know who's coming there. And the app would have been a fancy solution to that, but actually the law says um, you're not obliged to use it. And so um, even club owners are forced to let in people who don't use the app. So purpose, phase out, um, transparency in terms of open source coding, everything is defined in the law, which actually made us come late to the party from our, you know, uh, local perception. So in mid-June, we um, actually launched the app for uh, a broad public. And as of today, more or less, we have, um, have had 2 million downloads, which is one fourth of the population. Switzerland is, um, you know, uh, 8 million people. But actually, um, in terms of active users, it turns out the numbers are much lower. So you could say that um, around 17% of the population are active users. And guess what turns out of it? For the last month, so the month of July, we've had 13 positive COVID tests based on notifications from the app. That's a rather low number given all the effort we've put into it. 
and um, I repeat 13. So for example, the daily new cases right now, as of yesterday, is 350. So um, I think we, here's another statistic. From uh, June 5th, 25th to August 8th, we've had um, 5,200 new uh, infections. And um, you know, the way the app works is that um, once you're infected, you get a code. And if you have the app, you can enter the code into the app. So um, you only get the code actually if you have the app. So 750 uh, codes were being generated, but only 490 were being entered. And um, the trouble is because of the privacy, um, as Gar mentioned, um, you cannot see how many notifications the app generates. So it turns out that, um, you know, the system that is so much focusing on privacy and transparency, thanks to the privacy wars that emerged early, turns out to be sort of a blind system. And so what we see is only the amount of people who call the hotline and they themselves would mention, um, uh, I got a notification from the app. That is actually, you know, that enters these statistics or um, um, the number of people who tell it to their doctor. And so uh, we don't have a direct way to measure the effectiveness of, of the whole thing. We can approximate, um, as I think in the Irish case, uh, the number of codes currently, you know, running in the system, but that, that is sort of strategically blurred in order to, you know, protect uh, the privacy for others. So I think, um, you know, heading for autumn right now, cases are rising okay. um, in comparison to um, Germany, for example, where uh, we would fare at almost three times the number of new daily infections per capita, you know, as in uh, Germany. So Germany has 1,200 dailies and uh, we are 10 times smaller and we have 350 daily questions. Okay, Honest, so I was yeah. asking to come to an end as well. Mm -hmm. So here are my findings. I think the whole idea, you know, we try to collectively um, build a solution like a surveillance system and it didn't work. <laughs> so I'm less scared of surveillance as I was before, as I ever was. It's sort of a bad finding. And then, um, you know, what proves to be most important is that the manual back end doesn't work. So people who have an app, who go to their doctor, who get tested positive, they don't get the code and they don't enter it. Or it takes, as in one case, it takes 10 days to give them the code. And then we don't see, you know, what comes out of it. So I think, um, I think there's, that's kind of a mixed, um, mixed outcome of this whole giant solution. Solutionism is really, <laughs> It's really crap, as it turns out. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Stay with us uh, for a minute. It, it's impressive. I already found it very impressive with iPhone, uh, his openness and transparency on how it went in, in Norway and, and even the learnings and the failures. And, and you the same, being so transparent about all the effort that has been put in place and why you came to the party so late and still um, not having the results you hoped for. Uh, the Netherlands is coming to the party even later. Uh, what advice would you give them uh, uh, in just a quick note? I think um, Gar just mentioned in the chat that um, users can choose to share their metrics. Um, that's something really interesting. Um, I think we're also heading for a change in, in the law governing um, the app. And I think, um, you know, as compared to Germany, for example, it's great to have a law that governs actually when to, for example, phase out the app, because that's very unclear, for example, for the Germans, when should they actually stop using it? And so it can become this like eternal, you know, project and can creep out. I think to, to think about a, a, a governmental, you know, sort of like legal framework for the app, that's really useful. I think that's something countries should think of, despite the whole privacy, you know, or, you know, complementary to the whole privacy thing. Yeah, thank you so much. 
I'm going over to Cornelia, who is uh, uh, on the chat room, uh, uh, and we'll do the, the Q&A now. Hi, Cornelia. Great to have you here, not present in the room, but at your home, I see. <coughs> Please, could you lead um, this, this last 11 minutes we have uh, the discussion? Uh, uh, and everyone who wants to ask a question, you can put on your camera. Uh, and then we can see you. And to all the speakers again, thank you a lot for sharing your thoughts and your struggles. Uh, I, I've learned a lot today. Cornelia, it's yours. Sure. So I'll start with uh, from the top, and maybe there will be more uh, questions coming in. Uh, the first question uh, from Alessandra Speranza: What about the privacy of the Apple Android layer on which the COVID apps are based? Which I believe uh, Hannes already touched on briefly, but maybe it's nice to hear from. Evo or Har or perhaps also Ivan on this uh, topic from a from a technical perspective. Can you comment on uh, on that? Yeah. Har, maybe you can go first. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yes. Um, so that was that was definitely a consideration, and it's one thing that we had conversations with Apple with on the back of, uh, I guess, the, the lack of transparency that what was happening inside of the API, and uh, as a result, and. So Google have, and both, both Apple and Google have open sourced parts of it. Google have open sourced more of it. It's still not 100%. Documentation has gotten better. I think they've uh, they've explained some pieces. I think one thing that was causing issues in the Netherlands was around, it's the link between Bluetooth and the location service on the phone. And because it, it's bound into this set of sensors to do with location and Bluetooth can be used to identify location. Um, Google have said that they're going to decouple that from Android. So in a future version of Android, it's going to be outside of it. So they've made some moves on it. I, I think we're still, it's it's a work in progress. Hannes, please go ahead. Uh, you know, we, you. It, it became sort of a public uh, challenge, like a game to spot people using the uh, the app, because somehow you can detect them by, you know, looking for certain Bluetooth signals. So we actually created maps on where people walk. You cannot identify them, though. I'm not sure if anyone else wanted to, maybe uh, Evo, if you wanted to jump yeah. into the discussion or anyone else. Otherwise, we move on to the next question. Yeah, I think one thing that many people don't realize is that the, the Google Apple SDK, it's it's an on-device library that comes as part of the operating system. And it's, it's one out of about 250 system libraries in the operating system. And many apps use these very similar libraries to do things like store contact information, uh, store database information, etc. And um, if Apple wanted or Google wanted to abuse the system to, to, to gather data, there are 249 other libraries where they can actually basically do that and read your email, um, see where you are and know everything about you. So the fact that they would introduce such a backdoor inside this framework which basically revolves around yeah, transmitting random numbers to each other it, it, it's it's a kind of a, a of a far-fetched so uh, and of course there's ag agreements in place with apple there's the gdpr there's uh, lots of legislation that would actually prevent apple from gathering information that they aren't open about and google is very clear uh, for example they have a, a page about the telemetry data and the statistics that they gather mm. um, so the chance that that this would actually i mean this would probably destroy the company if, if it would leak that they would would do something with this information that 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 they shouldn't do so um the fear that apple and google would use this data without our knowledge i think it's a bit over how do you say it? It's, 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 it's a bit exaggerated because it's yeah, it's, it's a system library and I've, there are lots of agreements in place. I'm going to, I think it's a discussion that can carry on, but it's nice to be able to touch on a couple other questions. Uh, so Perfect. if you don't Thanks a lot. consider that. Um, I think the next question, uh, perhaps for Hylene or anyone else who would like to take it, but um, there's a question about whether it's possible to retrieve demographic information from the app. So. Uh, do we know the uh, the ages uh, or the areas of, of who's using this app? Um, I've heard some things about it, but it was from a colleague of Ivo, uh, of Evo. So Evo, could you answer this question? 
Yeah, it, like I mentioned, uh, we are, we're blind, so we, we, we don't know the location of users and we don't know anything about the statistics. So unfortunately, uh, from the app's perspective, we don't know uh, where people are using the app. Uh, this information would only come from like the if they make a phone call to actually uh, 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 make an appointment for a test, etc. Then mm -hmm. we know some more information and then we might be able to, to get some demographic information, but, but never from the app itself, because that's just stuff that we don't collect. Evo, if you yeah. like, would you put put on your camera and we can see you? And I have to panel. Uh, I think I think right. we're really we're really feeling the perils of going for the decentralized version now because the centralized guys they were planning for you know having this protected you know central data hub that would get all this information and kind of like put machine learning on top of it to see who's getting infected in which ways, which was the original. Vision. I, I know I know of the dangers, but nevertheless, you know, this is the outcome of transparency and you know and privacy. And you know, people really see it as this giant triumph of uh, you know, uh, here's a privacy solution, but actually it's a giant capitulation. We could have had something that would tell us a lot more about the infection, but given that we cannot trust state actors, we cannot trust uh, companies. And we cannot even trust third persons, you know, any form of hackers, private persons. We have to kind of like build a system that actually makes us be mostly blind. And that's that's sort of the sad outcome of this whole story for me, at least, you know. I'm, I, I'm running off. Yeah. One short interruption. Ivan, could you, if you like, please put turn on your camera on as well and then we have the panel complete, would be nice. And thank you so much, Hannes. Can I just say one thing on that point? Uh, so I, I think one of the interesting things that in Ireland, this was the trade-off that people were prepared to make. So they were prepared to give a phone number because they wanted, so you pay taxes to be cared for and the health service is there to care for you. So we gave people the opportunity to put a phone number in and they're using that phone number. So about 80% of the close contacts daily result in a phone call to the person. So we keep the decentralized piece, but we give people the opportunity opportunity to be contacted if something happens so it's not that we know all about them but if the event happens we're there to care and i think that's one of the interesting pieces with uh, that we're seeing anyway is that that gives us then the ability to get some of what you get with the centralized model we don't know who they were in contact with but we can then engage and do something and get them tested and i think that's there is something interesting in in what we're seeing i guess in comparison to what uh, what the what hans was describing in switzerland so I'm curious, well, like only time will tell and we need more data. That's the, yeah. Great, uh, uh, again, a slightly different question is about uh, what other behavior change uh, strategies are countries using? So what kinds of carrots and sticks do we see to get uh, people to use these apps? Maybe again, uh, we can hear some perspectives from Ireland or from Norway perhaps. Uh, so, well, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, far ahead. I was just going to say that, um, well, the app was voluntary use in and of itself, and there, they didn't really harp too much on, you know, sort of recruitment uh, messaging, but uh, they did have a few, uh, well, the Norwegian government did have a few press conferences. For instance, the press conference when they launched the app, they, while they repeated that use was voluntary, they kind of put it forth there in sort of a way that implied that this was something we all had to do to gain our freedom back and so on. So that that was the Norwegian strategy, I guess. So uh, I guess in Ireland, and it's we had a, a whole strategic communications campaign led by Department of Health and the HSC around how we were doing it. So that was the pre-piece beforehand. And then two weeks of kind of wall-to-wall -wall advertising across a range of different channels that all integrated into all of our existing COVID messaging. So that was kind of the initial drive. We'd also done a, a thousand person behavioral research trial beforehand around calls to action. So how do we, and so what came out of that was that this was a collective action thing. This wasn't about protecting me. This was about us working together to fight COVID-19. And that fed into the messaging for the app and how we positioned it. And that's been an ongoing piece. So we're now picking out, um, and again, it's the, the low hanging fruit is gone. I think somebody said that earlier on. We're now into the next piece, which is 
it's trying to figure out uh, how do we get to specific audience so to immigrant population so we've got new language versions coming out and we'll be just targeting more niche audiences to say how do we help old people how do we because it could be the first app they've ever installed uh, what can we do with so that it's all of those issues that we're kind of piecing through at the moment do we need I think to have time for one more question or do we uh, have to do i have to hand it back to you Mm, I'm afraid, well, one short question with one short answer, and then we go back to uh, summing up. Okay, I'm I not, let's, let's, let's see who can keep uh, the answer short, but there's a, a comment uh, from Alessandra that the concern is really actually about uh, the quarantine. So people fear uh, to have to stay uh, locked up if they actually use the app. So maybe it's nice to hear from the GGD perspective or anyone else would like to comment on this. Um. As far as I know, I think uh, from uh, also connecting to the last question, the um, uh, the message which is going to be inside uh, uh, the which which we will use for people to to download the app is going to be the same as Ireland. You're not doing it for yourself; you're doing it for the people around you, around you. And um, uh, I think when we are uh, to get back to the question she was worried about again. She was worried that people are not really using the app because they're worried about having to then deal with the consequence of being stuck in quarantine. Yeah, I think that, that that's a problem that's already there right now. That's also why people won't get tested. Um, and I think if we would, uh, uh, if it would work for us in order to gain the trust through the app from the people, and this would be an extra step or an extra uh, pat in the back, we would say in Dutch, <laughs> um, uh, to to actually get tested, then it, it would help us, but we will have to see uh, how it turns out. Okay, thank you. Okay. Maybe I hand it back to you. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Could I add one thing to that? Um, the, I, I noticed this fear because some people think that they will receive a notification like every week or, or, or 10 times a year, but the, the chance of running into somebody who's infected is, is is really low. Like even in in the uh, when we had like 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 uh, like in March when we had our peak, the per million uh, number of cases is such that probably uh, uh, most of the people never encounter somebody who is infected. So the, the 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 chance that you actually get a notification is is really low. So it's not like you get uh, you get one every week. Maybe you get one once a year or maybe never. Uh, and then if you get them, yeah, of course we hope that people are. Uh, uh, sensible and and will remain home or not visit their grandma etc but yeah the, the fear that that you will get lots of notifications that, that that's hopefully exaggerated yeah i must come to an end uh, thank you eva for this uh, remark because uh, uh, i see people uh, leaving thank you so much audience for being here being present thank you so much speakers and, and being able to even look into your homes your children your drum station uh it was really a pleasure to have so many thoughts and, and opening up uh, on the table. Hope to see you and impress at what we have learned and done so far in only a couple of months. Uh, with all the imperfections at place and still learning to, to make it better. Hope to meet you somewhere again and hopefully live. Uh, we will be able to embrace each other again. Till that time, stay safe. Uh, stay happy and uh, to all, thank you a lot. Bye bye, have a great evening. Thank you.